For almost the entirety of NBA history, the MVP voting has followed a very specific formula that they very rarely diverge from. For one, you need to be on an elite winning team. Number two, you have to have really nice stats, but not necessarily the best stats as long as you're winning a lot. And number three, you have to have a nice story to your season. Specifically, to really emphasize how important winning is to the formula, listen to this. In the past 30 years of NBA basketball, 27 of the 30 MVP winners have finished as a top two team in his conference. Those three exceptions were Russell Westbrook in 2017 when he averaged a triple-double and the past two MVP seasons from Nikola Jokic, where he set new records for basketball efficiency. So unless you can do something that's so incredibly historic that it breaks the formula, you're not winning MVP unless your team is an elite winning team. But is this fair? Is this really the best way to gauge a player's value? Many people don't think so, and think that the award too strongly favors players on elite teams, rather than who's honestly the best player or the most valuable player in a literal sense. So what if we said screw the formula, and instead just gave the award to the player who was literally that season's best player? Well, things would change up quite a bit. Today, we're looking at every MVP season since 1960, and let me know in a comment if you agree or disagree with these choices. In 1960, Wilt Chamberlain was named the league's MVP despite the fact that he was a rookie, and on this new list, he's keeping the award, ahead of Bill Russell, Bob Pettit, and Elgin Baylor. From an impact standpoint, Wilt completely catapulted the Philadelphia Warriors organization as they improved 17 wins over the previous season. That's all well and good, but it was his shocking individual numbers that earned him the league MVP, as he averaged 37.6 points, 27 rebounds, and 2.3 assists on 46.1% shooting. Not only were his points and rebounds average the highest ever for a rookie, but no one other than himself has ever eclipsed those averages in a season. Considering his victorious impact to go along with his statistically historic debut season, there really isn't much of an argument for anyone to get the MVP this season outside of Wilt. In 1961, Bill Russell was selected as the league's MVP, but in this case, he's losing the award to his rival, Wilt Chamberlain. At this time in NBA history, the voters of the MVP award were actually the league's players, and they almost universally agreed that Bill Russell was the most deserving player this season. This was in large part for the fact that Bill Russell Celtics had the best record in the NBA by far, including 11 more victories than Wilt Chamberlain's Warriors. But from an individual standpoint, it's clear that Chamberlain outperformed and outproduced Russell throughout the regular season, as Wilt put up a superior 38.4 points, 27.2 rebounds, and 1.9 assists on 50.9% shooting. The offensive end wasn't the only area that Wilt was a threat, as he had already established himself as one of the fiercest rim protectors of all time. Although Russell shared that skill set, Wilt was way too far above him on offense for it to be all that close this season. In 1962, Bill Russell won arguably the most controversial MVP award in league history, and unsurprisingly, on my list, he's losing the award to the record-breaking season of Wilt Chamberlain. Russell was the ultimate team leader, and his impact was on full display, as he led his Celtics to a 60-20 record while putting up 19 points, nearly 24 rebounds, and 4.5 assists on 45.7% shooting. Russell's performance this season was certainly strong enough to earn MVP attention on most seasons, and the same goes for the Cincinnati Royals' Oscar Robertson, who put up arguably the strongest triple-double average in NBA history. But let's be real. Those performances were dwarfed by the video game-like season from the man they called Goliath. No other player in the history of the NBA has ever averaged over 40 points per game over the course of a season, and Wilt averaged north of 50. At one point, he had a streak of four straight games with at least 60 points, and the fourth game was his 100-point performance. This season, he averaged an astonishing 48.5 minutes per game, which was only possible because of the overtime games he participated in. Other than one instance where he had been ejected by the ref, Wilt played every single minute of every single game that season. That level of stamina is completely unheard of in the modern game. If there was ever a year where Wilt was clearly the best individual player, this was it. In 1963, Bill Russell was once again named the league MVP, 
but when we eliminate team success and look strictly at the individuals, he loses the award to the dominant Will Chamberlain. From a defensive and rebounding standpoint, Russell's impact was as strong as ever, as his Celtics had the best defensive rating in the entire league. The thing is, the gap in offensive ability was still too great for him to make up between him and Chamberlain, as Wilt averaged nearly 30 more points per game on nearly 10% better field goal percentage. Even in terms of free throw percentage, Wilt had the edge on Russell. At this point in history, the general consensus was that Wilt didn't win as many games as Russell due to his selfish style of play. This resulted in Wilt finishing in the seventh spot on the actual MVP list, despite averaging a ridiculous 45 and 24. On this list, a narrative like that isn't strong enough to keep him from getting the MVP. In 1964, Oscar Robertson was selected as the league's MVP, and on my list, he's keeping the award, ahead of Wilt Chamberlain and Bill Russell. Yes, Wilt was dominating statistically as usual, as he put up this monstrous stat line, but there's a couple things you have to factor in before you understand why Oscar had the edge this season. For one, rebounds were insanely inflated during this era, thanks to lower field goal percentages and an insanely fast pace of play. The edge that Wilt had in rebounding, Oscar easily made up in efficiency. Not only did the Big O average a near triple-double, but he was second overall in scoring, first among guards in rebounding, first overall in assists per game, first among shooting guards in field goal percentage, and first overall in free throw percentage. He did all of this while leading his Royals to a 55-25 record. It would take a historic effort to seize an MVP from Wilt during his prime stretch and that's exactly what Oscar had this season. In 1965, Bill Russell once again was selected as the MVP, and he's losing the award to Oscar Robertson. Although Russell once again had a strong season, it lacked the all-around productivity of Oscar's campaign, as the Big O once again put up a near triple-double average season, with insane efficiency. Not only did Oscar lead the NBA in assists per game, but at this point in history, that was the highest seasonal average that the league had ever seen. Along with his monstrous basic stats, he also led all players that year in win shares. In 1966, Wilt Chamberlain won the league MVP, but on this list, he's losing the award to Jerry West. At first glance, Wilt Chamberlain and Oscar Robertson appeared to have had a much more productive season than West, but those two greats were playing way more minutes per game than the logo which tells us that West was likely producing at a rate faster than anyone else. West was also efficient, as he shot 47.3% from the field, which was especially sharp for a perimeter shooting guard in the 1960s, and he also shot a lethal 86% from the free throw line on a tremendous 12.4 attempts per game. For perspective, James Harden has never averaged that many free throw attempts per game over a season. This skill from West especially stood out considering how Wilt was averaging the same amount of free throw attempts, but was making far fewer per game. West isn't winning the award as a one-way player either, as it's widely known by basketball historians that he was one of the all-time great perimeter defensive players, and would have almost certainly been first team all defense if that honor had existed at this point in history as he was a fierce pickpocket, an underrated shot blocker, and one of the best on-ball defenders in the game. In 1967, Wilt Chamberlain won yet another league MVP, and he's keeping the award thanks to an effective change in his game. This was the point in Wilt's career where the selfish narratives were beginning to get on his nerves. So as a way to prove a point, Wilt then became more of a distributor, and immediately found himself among the league leaders in assists per game. A more team-oriented Wilt was more efficient from the field, as he shot a mind-blowing 68.3% on the season. Wilt's unselfish play was the main factor in the 76ers finishing with a 68-13 record, which at the time was the winningest season in NBA history. Several other greats had amazing seasons as well, like Nate Thurmond, Bill Russell, Oscar Robertson, and Rick Barry. But with that being said, there's little doubt in my mind that Wilt was easily the most deserving player this season. In 1968, Wilt Chamberlain won the league MVP, and he's keeping the award slightly ahead of Oscar Robertson. Not only did Chamberlain nearly average a triple-double this season, but he also led all players in overall assists, proving that a center can also be successful as a distributor. 
He led his defending champion 76ers to a league-best 62-20 record, and along the way, he was locking down the paint defensively as the 76ers finished that season with a number one ranked defense. With Oscar Robertson's monstrous stat line, he had a chance to pull this award away from Wilt, especially when you look at the laughably massive gap between their free throw percentages. The thing is, Oscar dealt with some injuries that season, and only participated in 65 games that year, compared to Wilt who played all 82, which helped secure the award in his favor. In 1969, Wes Unseld was named the league MVP at the young age of 22, but on this new list, he loses the award to the late great Willis Reed. Per usual, the fact that the Baltimore Bullets had the best record in the NBA played a part in why Wes Unseld was winning the award over Reed, but there was only a three game difference between their records. From an individual standpoint, Reed seemed to clearly have the edge, as he put up a strong stat line of 21.1 points, 14.5 rebounds, and 2.3 assists on a remarkably efficient 52.1% from the field and 74.7% from the free throw line. Reed also had the highest win share total of any player that season. Wilt might deceive some into thinking that he had a more productive season than Reed, but Willis played significantly less minutes. So as far as the time they spent on the court, Willis clearly outperformed Chamberlain at this later stage of his career. In 1970, the New York Knicks finished with the best record in the regular season, and their own Willis Reed was narrowly named the league MVP. And on this new list, he loses the award to Jerry West. Willis was a 6'9 center slash power forward whose impact on the league has become somewhat overlooked from the greats of the 60s and 70s. At this point, he was 27 years old and in the prime of his career, as the tandem of him and Walt Frazier dominated the league this season. Willis put up an impressive 21.7 points, 13.9 rebounds, and two assists on 50.7% shooting while also making first team all defense. Although this was a great season from an individual standpoint, it is likely that his peers' voting patterns were influenced by the Knicks' overall success, because even though the Lakers won 14 less games than the Knicks, it's pretty clear that from a production standpoint that West clearly stood out in that battle, as Jerry put up a strong 31.2 points, 7.5 assists, and 4.6 rebounds on 49.7% shooting. He was first in scoring, fourth in assists, he was 15th overall in field goal percentage, even though he was playing as a perimeter shooter. He was first in win shares, he had the highest player efficiency rating, and he was the best defender at his position as he was named first team all defense. If steals per game had been tracked at this point in the NBA, then he may have led the league in those as well, as West had a reputation of being one of the best pickpockets in the entire league. Now Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who at the time was Lou Alcindor, finished third overall in the actual MVP voting. And you could certainly argue that he should have won the award this season as he put up his typical monstrous numbers. But unlike Weston Reed, Kareem didn't make first team all defense. Therefore, West keeps his edge. But Kareem's time was approaching quickly and in a major way. In 1971, Lou Alcindor slash Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was named the league MVP, and he's keeping the award ahead of Jerry West and John Havlicek. The 1971 Bucks are remembered as one of the great teams of NBA history, as Kareem led them to a 66-win season behind numbers of 31.7 points, 16 rebounds, and 3.3 assists on 57.7% shooting. He was second team all defense as he led the league in scoring, he was second in field goal percentage, he was third in rebounds, and he dominated the rest of the league in most advanced stats, including win shares and PER. Other players had great seasons as well, like Jerry West and John Havlicek, who put up impressive stat lines. But the truth is, it didn't matter which angle you take this season. From an individual standpoint, from an impact standpoint, and from a team standpoint, no one was close to Kareem's greatness this season. In 1972, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was again named the league MVP, and he's keeping the award ahead of Jerry West and Wilt Chamberlain. This was a historic season between two juggernaut teams, the Lakers with Jerry West, Gil Goodrich, and Wilt Chamberlain, and the Bucks with Kareem and Oscar Robertson. The 72 Lakers are recognized as one of the greatest teams in NBA history, as they won a league record at the time, 69 games, and also set the NBA record with 33 straight wins, a mark that still stands to this day. Wilt Chamberlain was a major reason for their success, as his rebounding and outlet passes was the engine that drove their fast break offense. He did it to the tune of 14.8 points, 19.2 rebounds, and 4 assists on a tremendous 64.9% shooting. 
He was also the league's greatest rim protector at the time, as he made first team all defense. West did his part as well, averaging over 25 points, a league leading 9.7 assists per game and 4.2 rebounds on 47.7% shooting. Even with all of their collective success, and even with their MVP caliber performances, Kareem still stands out, as he averaged video game numbers of 34.8 points, 16.6 rebounds, and 4.6 assists on 57.4% shooting. He led the Bucks to win 63 games, and they were actually the team that snapped the Lakers' 33-game winning streak. Chamberlain was technically more efficient from the field, but not nearly enough to overlook the fact that Kareem averaged 20 more points. And when you include free throw percentage, the gap becomes very marginal as they had nearly the same true shooting percentage. All that goes to say is that despite the Lakers getting the last laugh, Kareem clearly deserved the award this year. In 1973, Dave Cowens won the MVP, but he's losing the award, once again, to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Now even though the players were the ones doing the voting at this point, they had a lot of the same voting tendencies as the media members do today, and that's to often reward the MVP to the best player from the best team. In this case, this was the underrated Dave Cowens, as the big man led his Celtics to the league's best record with plenty of 20 point and 20 rebound nights. As good as Cowens was, Kareem was 5 inches taller, more skilled offensively, and just a greater overall athlete. And individually, he absolutely destroyed Cowens from a production standpoint, as Kareem put up 30, 16, and 5 on 55% shooting. But there was another player who seriously challenged Kareem this season, and that was Nate Tiny Archibald. The 6'1 point guard was skilled in so many ways. He was a quick, shifty guard with incredible vision, he was one of the greatest ball handlers of his era, and he was a lethal scorer, who would slash to the basket and was elite at finishing around the rim. He was very crafty, using his high basketball IQ to get himself to his sweet spots. This season, Archibald put up a ridiculous 34 points, 11.4 assists, and 2.8 rebounds on 48.8% shooting. Remarkably, he led the league in scoring and assists, as he was almost the entire offense for his Kansas City Kings. He was leaned upon so much offensively that he played a league-leading 46 minutes per game. His Kings only won 36 games, but he was certainly the man who carried them to just about all of them. So you could certainly make a case for the award to go to Archibald, but for me, ultimately the edge goes to Kareem, whose elite impact was on both sides of the basketball, which was the key factor for their winning success. In 1974, Kareem was named the league MVP once again in a very close race, and on this new list, he's barely keeping the award ahead of Bob McAdoo. Once again, Kareem led his Bucks to a very successful year as they won 59 games with Abdul-Jabbar skyhooking his way to averages of 27 points, 14.5 rebounds, 4.8 assists, 1.4 steals, and 3.5 blocks on 53.9% shooting. Bob McAdoo, on the other hand, was only in his sophomore season, and as a 22-year-old, the 6'9 center broke out in a major way, averaging over 30 points, over 15 rebounds, 2.3 assists, 1.2 steals, and 3.3 blocks on 54.7% shooting. McAdoo was one of the first stretch bigs, and with his solid footwork and his smooth jump shot, he was dominating the competition from an extremely young age. He led the Buffalo Braves to a 42-40 record, and with numbers similar to Kareem's, you could certainly argue that he was the best offensive player this season. But Kareem was once again first-team all-defense, as he was also second in the league in block shots. Therefore, Abdul-Jabbar continues his dominance of the award. In 1975, Bob McAdoo was named the league's MVP, and he's keeping the award ahead of Kareem and Rick Barry. McAdoo was only 23 years old and greatly improved his Braves to a 49-33 record, while dropping 34.5 points, 14.1 rebounds, 2.2 assists, and 2.1 blocks on 51.2% shooting. This was one of the more efficient, great scoring seasons of basketball history, as he not only averaged nearly 35 points while shooting over 50%, but he also shot 80.5% from the free throw line, which is incredible for someone who plays the center position. He had by far the highest amount of win shares that season, and no one was close to his scoring output. Pretty remarkable stuff for a big man who did a major part of his scoring from the mid-range or beyond. Now Kareem did his usual thing, as he had one of the greatest individual seasons for a guy who didn't win the MVP award. It didn't translate to much winning though, as this was his first season after Oscar Robertson's retirement, so the shorthanded Bucks only had 38 victories and missed the playoffs. Honorable mention goes to Rick Barry, 
whose stat line looks very similar to prime Kobe Bryant numbers, as his Warriors won 48 games and eventually the NBA championship. As impressive as his regular season was, the players who voted got it right, as McAdoo was simply on another level that regular season. In 1976, Kareem took his award back, as he was once again named the MVP, and he's keeping the award slightly ahead of Bob McAdoo. In Kareem's first season after being traded to the Los Angeles Lakers, the highly motivated big man put up a monstrous campaign of 27.7 points, 16.9 rebounds, 5 assists, and 4.1 blocks on 52.9% shooting. He was second in the league in scoring, first in rebounds, 15th overall in assists, and he led the league in block shots by a wide margin. He made his regular appearance on the NBA's All-Defense team, and he also had top honors in win shares and player efficiency rating. He did improve his team from the previous season, but they only finished with a 40-42 and 42 record, making him only the second player in NBA history to win the MVP award while playing for a losing team. That's how good he was individually that season. McAdoo once again put up a tremendous fight in another great regular season, as he led the Braves to 46 wins and yet another playoff appearance. But with that being said, no one impacted the game in as many ways as Kareem did that year. In 1977, Kareem won the MVP yet again, and he's keeping the award as he was clearly this season's most complete player. By his standards, this was relatively a pretty tame season for the 29-year-old Kareem, as he put up over 26 points, 13 rebounds, 4 assists, and 3 blocks on 57.9% shooting. The captain was second team all defense, and really, there's not much to be said that hasn't already been said about him. He was basically the original model of consistency and longevity, and he was seemingly in the MVP conversation just about every season. Probably the guy who gave Kareem the greatest opposition this season was Pistol Pete Maravich, who was the driving force of his New Orleans Jazz offense. He was lethal on the fast break, he had an incredible handle of the basketball, and he was one of the best perimeter shooters at his time. He led the league in scoring that season, as he put up 31.1 points, 5.1 rebounds, and 5.4 assists on 43.3% shooting. Now that efficiency isn't terrible for a perimeter shooting guard, but when the guy you're going up against is nearly 60% from the field, it's difficult to overlook. Combine that with the fact that Kareem was either the best or second best rim protector at the time, and it's easy to see why the big man keeps the award. In 1978, Bill Walton was the league's MVP, as he led the Blazers most of the way to 58 wins. But on this new list, he loses the award to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Bill is one of the forgotten great big men of NBA history, whose career would have been so much better if it hadn't been for his numerous injuries. Walton had many skills, as he was a terrific passer, a great rebounder, and an elite shot blocker. On the regular season, he averaged 18.9 points, 13.2 rebounds, 5 assists, and 2.5 blocks on 52.2% shooting. Now what's interesting is how Walton's peers voted him as the MVP, despite the fact that he dealt with injuries this season and only played in 58 games. Due to this, of the 14 players who got MVP votes this season, Walton only ranked in 11th place in win shares. Now with that being said, my choice for the award is Kareem, who also only played in 62 games that season. Yet despite that, Kareem was still second among MVP candidates in win shares. When you look at their stats next to each other, you can see that Kareem averaged nearly 10 more points, more blocks, and was significantly more efficient from both the field and the free throw line. It's hard to say whether or not voter fatigue played a role in the players picking Walton over Kareem, but from a pure production standpoint, it's Kareem and it's not even close. Now as far as Abdul-Jabbar playing in only 62 games, there was other MVP candidates who played a full season. But in terms of all-around impact and production, it's a major drop-off between Kareem and the rest of the crowd. I will say that 1978 is easily the weakest group of MVP candidates of this decade. With Kareem missing as many games as he did, it might be seen as a bit controversial to some, but I think he takes the award. In 1979, Moses Malone of the Houston Rockets was named the NBA's MVP, and he's keeping the award slightly ahead of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I've said it in past videos, but in my opinion, Moses Malone is the most underrated center in NBA history, and in 1979, the 23-year-old center had a season for the ages, as he put up 24.8 points, an absurd 17.6 rebounds, 1.8 assists, and 1.5 blocks on 54% shooting. He was also second-team all-defense. 
Now his 17.6 rebounds was incredible enough in itself, but it actually gets even more impressive than that. Moses was a beast at battling for rebound position on the offensive end, and he's likely the greatest offensive rebounder in NBA history. In that area, there was no season greater than this one, as he averaged 7.2 offensive rebounds per game. That's the highest recorded average for a season of all time. And from an impact standpoint, that is a ton of second chance opportunities to give your team on a nightly basis. Kareem had yet another MVP worthy season as he was just entering his early 30s. But when you consider all the different variables and the way Moses dominated the boards on a historic level, I think he overwhelmingly deserves it this season. In 1980, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar won the MVP award, and he's keeping the award ahead of the likes of Julius Irving and George Gervin. The captain led the Lakers to a 62-20 record, which was the best record in the entire league. But this wasn't just a case of giving the award to the best player on the best team, but a 33-year-old Kareem was still legitimately the league's best overall player. This was far from his prime years, but Kareem still controlled the game in many ways, as he averaged 24.8 points, 10.8 rebounds, 4.5 assists, and 3.4 blocks on a remarkable 60.4% shooting. His 3.4 blocks led the league that season as his elite rim protection earned him a first-team all-defense appearance, and if the Defensive Player of the Year award had existed at that point, he may have won that award as well. Now it's worth noting that George the Iceman Gervin finished third in the actual MVP voting with averages of 33.1 points, 5.2 rebounds, 2.6 assists, and 1.4 steals on 52.8% shooting. Despite officially leading the league in scoring as a shooting guard, he didn't get more MVP consideration since his Spurs finished with only a 41-41 record. Although I think this season deserves some attention, the Iceman was known primarily as a one-sided player, who was without question one of the greatest scorers of all time, but was far from an elite defensive player. So ultimately, I have to give the edge to Kareem, who didn't have a weak spot in his game on either side of the court. In 1981, Julius Irving was the league MVP winner, and now he loses the award to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. This was one of the closest MVP races in NBA history between Julius Irving and Larry Bird as both stars led their teams to 62 win seasons, and both small forwards put up really nice numbers as well, but the player who dominated on both ends was once again the captain, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who put up averages of 26.2 points, 10.3 rebounds, 3.4 assists, and 2.9 blocks on 57.4% shooting. Despite being 34 years old, Kareem was still the most overall dominant player in the league as he was the best defender at his position, making first team all defense. He also led the league in win shares and in player efficiency rating. If playoffs were included in the formula, then Bird's championship run likely earns him the title of best player. But since it's just the regular season, Kareem takes a strong grasp on this one. In 1982, Moses Malone won the MVP award, and he's keeping the award as he was clearly that season's most dominant force. Now many stars had best player caliber seasons, like Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, George Gervin, and Adrian Dantley. But for one reason or another, Moses has continuously been overlooked among the all-time greats, despite the fact that he was legitimately the league's best player for a small stretch in the 80s. Moses put up monstrous numbers of 31.1 points, 14.7 rebounds, and 1.5 blocks on 52% shooting. Despite his Rockets only winning 46 games this season, Moses still ran away with the award because he was the clear catalyst for every bit of success that team had. To give you an idea of how impressive his 31 points and 14 rebounds were, in the 38 seasons since this year, no one has ever eclipsed both of those averages in a season. Moses wasn't just great at rebounding the basketball, but more specifically, he was arguably the greatest of all time at offensive rebounds. Moses averaged 6.9 offensive rebounds this year. No one else in the history of the NBA has ever officially averaged as many offensive rebounds as Moses did this season. That's a ton of second chance opportunities to consistently provide for your team, and was one of the major reasons why they were so successful. Overall, Moses led the league in rebounds, win shares, and player efficiency rating. Definitely an underrated MVP season from arguably the most underrated big man in NBA history. In 1983, Moses Malone was named the league's MVP, and he's keeping the award for the second straight season. Larry Bird and Magic Johnson each had best player caliber seasons as Magic averaged about 17, 10, and 8 on 55% shooting, while Bird put up around 23, 11, and 6 on 50% shooting. 
But with that being said, they still weren't quite ready to take the title of best player in the league because Moses was still in his prime and had his sights set on a championship. For the actual MVP voting, the 27-year-old Malone earned 69 out of the 75 first place votes. It wasn't even close, as he and the 76ers dominated in every single aspect. They finished the regular season with a 65-17 record on their way to the NBA championship. But even outside of the team's success, Moses dominated individually on an all-time great level, as he put up 24.5 points, 15.3 rebounds, and 2 blocks on 50% shooting. Once again, no one has eclipsed both of his 24 points and 15 rebound averages in the same season since he accomplished it in 1983. On top of all of that, he was also the league's best defender at the center position as he made first team all defense. In 1984, Larry Bird was the league MVP, but on this new list, he loses the award to Magic Johnson. Now if the playoffs were factored in, then Larry would be keeping the award without question as his Celtics won the championship and Magic Johnson disappointed in the clutch situations. But when only considering the regular season for the title of best player, this is one of Magic's strongest cases over Bird, as Magic averaged 17.3 points, 13.1 assists, 7.3 rebounds, and 2.2 steals on a career-best 56.5% shooting, which is incredibly efficient by point guard standards. His 13.1 assists was also his career best. Bird, on the other hand, put up 24.2 points, 10.1 rebounds, 6.6 .6 assists, and 1.8 steals on 49.2% shooting. Whenever it comes to these great icons of the 80s, we're always forced to split hairs. But one of the major reasons I gave the edge to Magic this season, for one, is because of Magic's incredible efficiency this year. But the second reason was because of Larry's unusual lack of efficiency from the perimeter. For his career, Bird was known as one of the greatest shooters of all time, but this season specifically was one of his worst in that area, as he couldn't quite find the shooting touch throughout the entirety of the regular season. On the year, he shot only 24.7% from three-point range, which is atrocious by his standards and was even less than the league's average. With all of these things considered, I think Magic comfortably takes the award in 1984. In 1985, Larry Bird won the MVP award, and he's keeping the award as he was just entering the prime years of his individual career. 1985 had a jam-packed group of stars who were competing for the title of best player, which included great individual seasons from a rookie Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, Isaiah Thomas, Bernard King, and Moses Malone. With that being said, this explanation will be quick, because during that regular season, Larry was performing at a level clearly above the rest of them, as he averaged 28.7 points, 10.5 rebounds, 6.6 .6 assists, 1.6 steals, and 1.2 blocks on 52.2% shooting. There wasn't an area in his game where he was lacking. Larry also looked more like himself from the perimeter this season, as he shot a lethal 42.7% from three-point range and 88.2% from the free throw line. Whether it was his traditional stats, the eye test, or advanced analytics, Larry stood out among the crowd as he led the league in win shares, player efficiency rating, and plus minus. In 1986, Larry Bird won his third actual MVP award, and on this new list, he's keeping the award. When we look at the legends of the 1980s, it can be easy to just see Bird as one of the stars in the mix. But what many people forget is that from a production standpoint for a while, he was clearly the best player in the league. He's an underrated defender as he actually made several all-defense team appearances throughout his career, and offensively, he could do it all. And this year was no exception, as he averaged 25.8 points, 9.8 rebounds, 6.8 assists, and 2 steals on 49.6% shooting. Even the years where Bird didn't have 50-40-90 percentages, he was still very close to doing so, as he shot 42.3% from 3-point range and 89.6% from the free throw line this season. Once again, he dominated the analytics as he was first in player efficiency rating, win shares, and plus minus. Dominique Wilkins' solid season of 30 points and 8 rebound averages definitely deserves some acknowledgement, but he was certainly less efficient than Bird all around, as well as being a much weaker defensive player. Magic also had himself a typical impressive Magic Johnson season, but Bird was simply on another level this year. In 1987, Magic Johnson won the league MVP, but now he loses the award to Michael Jordan. This was by far the most difficult year for me to make my choice, because it was a tight three-man race between three of the greatest players of all time, Magic, Bird, and Jordan. Based on the NBA's actual MVP formula, it was only fitting to give the award to Magic, 
whose Lakers had by far the best record in the entire league at 65 wins and 17 losses. They also bolstered the best offense in the game, which was orchestrated by Magic himself. But when you take team success out of the equation and simply look at it on an individual level, then things start to get really cloudy this season. Magic averaged 23.9 points, 12.2 assists, 6.3 rebounds, and 1.7 steals on 52% shooting. He was such a unique combination of lethal facilitating and scoring this season. Nobody in the history of the NBA other than Magic Johnson has ever averaged as many points per game while averaging at least 12 assists per game. There's many reasons why people consider this guy the greatest point guard of all time that go way beyond just the championships. Then you have Larry Bird, who put up 28.1 points, 9.2 rebounds, 7.6 assists, and 1.8 steals on 52.5% shooting. Not only was Bird lethal as a legitimate scorer, rebounder, facilitator, and an underrated defender, but he was historically efficient while doing it, as he had his first of two straight 50-40-90 seasons, putting up percentages of 52% from the field, 40% from three, and 91% from the free throw line. With numbers and skills like this, while leading his team to 59 wins, this is certainly one of the greatest seasons of all time from a player who didn't win the MVP award. Lastly, there's Michael Jordan, who barely earns my selection this year as the best player, as he averaged 37.1 points, 5.2 rebounds, 4.6 assists, 2.9 steals, and 1.5 blocks in what was the highest scoring season of all time by anyone not named Wilt Chamberlain. Jordan had one stretch where he scored at least 40 points in nine straight games, which is tied for the longest streak in NBA history with Kobe, once again by anyone not named Wilt Chamberlain. Part of the reason Jordan gets the edge over the other two greats is not just because he was a force on the offensive end, but also because he was a force on the defensive end. Jordan's lockdown reputation was building quickly at this point, as he was second in the league in steals and first in the league among guards and blocked shots. By most major analytics, Jordan holds the edge as well, as he was first in player efficiency rating, first in plus minus, first in win shares, and fourth in defensive win shares ahead of Magic Johnson and Larry Bird. I had to split hairs to make the choice this season, so I'm curious to hear who you would pick in 1987. Honorable mention this year goes to Kevin the Torture Chamber McHale, who averaged 26.1 points, 9.9 .9 rebounds, and 2.2 blocks on 60.4% shooting and 83.6% from the free throw line, making him the first player to ever shoot at least 60% from the field and 80% from the free throw line in the same season. In 1988, Michael Jordan won the MVP, and he's definitely keeping the award. In this season, several players had an incredible year that would usually be good enough to earn the title of best player that season. Among them were especially Larry Bird, then Magic Johnson, and Charles Barkley. But the reason Jordan keeps it isn't simply because he had a great MVP season, but on an individual level, he had arguably the greatest MVP season of all time, as he averaged 35 points, 5.5 rebounds, 5.9 assists, 3.2 steals, and 1.6 blocks on 53.5% shooting. He dominated pretty much every aspect of the game, and he was extremely efficient while doing it. Not only was he the MVP, but he was also named that season's Defensive Player of the Year, which only him and Elijah Wan have achieved both awards in the same season. He was first in scoring, first in steals, first in blocks among guards, first in field goal percentage among shooting guards, first in true shooting percentage among shooting guards, first in win shares, first in player efficiency rating, and first in plus minus. I think you get the point. Jordan made the selection this season the easiest of the decade. In 1989, Magic Johnson won the MVP, and now he loses the award to Michael Jordan. In the actual MVP voting, this was an extremely close race between the two greats. But as usual, the player with the better team record won the award. Magic put up 22.5 points, 12.8 assists, 7.9 rebounds, and 1.8 steals on 51% shooting. And from a team perspective, you could certainly argue that his impact, influence, and leadership deserved the award. Jordan, on the other hand, put up 32.5 points, 8 assists, 8 rebounds, and 2.9 steals on 53.8% shooting. Not only do Jordan's offensive stats appear to have the edge, but he was also clearly the better defensive player, as Jordan was once again first team all defense, which is something that Magic never accomplished in his career. In the second half of the regular season, Doug Collins moved Jordan to the point guard position. During that time as the point guard, Jordan had a streak where he had 7 straight triple doubles and 10 triple doubles in 11 games. 
In those final 24 games as the point guard, Jordan averaged over 30 points, over 9 rebounds, and over 10 assists, all while being efficient on offense and dominant on defense. On the year, he was first in win shares, first in player efficiency rating, and first in plus minus. As amazing as Magic was, sometimes it's just nearly impossible to compete with Jordan on an individual basis. In 1990, Magic Johnson was the league MVP, and on this new list, he loses the award to Michael Jordan. As a 30-year-old, Magic was basically in the prime of his career, and thanks to his Lakers 63-win record, he won the MVP that season. He did his usual thing, putting up 22.3 points, 11.5 assists, 6.6 .6 rebounds, and 1.7 steals on 48% shooting. Now Michael, on the other hand, had monstrous numbers, leading the league in scoring with 33.6 points, 6.9 rebounds, 6.3 assists, and 2.8 steals on 52.6% shooting. No other guard or forward in NBA history has averaged as many points as Jordan did this season and shot over 50% from the field, let alone Jordan's 52.6%. This was also Jordan's first season where he broke out as a more dangerous three-point shooter as he shot 37.6% from that distance. To put that sharp shooting in perspective, he shot the three ball more efficiently that season than great shooters like Larry Bird, Clyde Drexler, Mitch Richmond, Terry Porter, Chuck Person, and Chris Mullen. Magic Johnson never made an all-defense team in his career, and of course, Jordan was the greatest two-way player of all time. And this year was no exception, as he led the league in steals, he was a fantastic on-ball defender, and made first team all defense. By almost every individual metric, he was that season's best player. He had easily the best player efficiency rating at 31.2, he had the highest amount of win shares, and he had the league's best plus-minus score to go along with his incredible traditional stats. Ultimately, this choice was pretty easy, if I'm being honest. In 1991, Michael Jordan was the MVP winner, and on this list, he keeps the award, but just by a bit. Magic Johnson was the MVP runner-up, but there was a handful of players who had monstrous MVP caliber seasons, like Charles Barkley, Carl Malone, Patrick Ewing, Hakeem Olajuwon, and David Robinson. Robinson specifically is the one that came the closest to overthrowing Jordan. Obviously, if we included the postseason, it wouldn't be close, as Jordan dominated the playoffs, won the championship, and the finals MVP. But since it was just the regular season, the Admiral made it close, as he was first team all defense while leading the league in rebounds. He put up 25.6 points, 13 rebounds, 1.5 steals, and 3.9 blocks on 55.2% shooting. Compare that to Jordan, who led the league in scoring, putting up 31.5 points, 6 rebounds, 5.5 assists, 2.7 steals, and 1 block on 54% shooting. Both guys dominated on each end, they had almost identical true shooting percentages, and Jordan had a significantly better player efficiency rating, so he ever so slightly keeps his edge. If you hate Michael Jordan, you're really not going to like this video because the theme continues for a bit. In 1992, MJ was the MVP winner, and he definitely keeps the award. I'll make this one quick, but he was universally recognized as the league's best player at this point. He was the best defender at his position, making first team all defense, and he had strong averages of 30, 6, 6, and 2 steals on 52% shooting. Clyde Drexler was that season's runner-up, but he wasn't nearly the defender that MJ was, and his stat line was nice, but it wasn't nearly as impressive. I would probably rank Robinson as the runner-up this season under this new format, but with that being said, MJ was still clearly on another level. In 1993, Charles Barkley was the MVP winner, and now he loses the award, to big surprise, Michael Jordan. Call it voter fatigue, call it best player on the best team, call it whatever you want. The reality was that despite Barkley's sons having the best record in the league by a small margin, Michael Jordan was still the league's best individual player. Now Chuck's season was certainly a worthy contender, as he put up 25.6 points, 12.2 rebounds, 5.1 assists, and 1.6 steals on 52% shooting. If Barkley was one of the best offensive players in the league, then maybe I could make an argument for him to keep the award. But unfortunately, he never made an all-defense team appearance in the entirety of his career. 
and Jordan was yet again the best defender at his position, making first team all defense and led the league in steals to go along with his typical fantastic numbers of 32.6 points, 6.7 rebounds, 5.5 assists, and 2.8 steals on 49.5% shooting. With all of this Michael Jordan MVP dominating, it's crazy that I'm not even factoring in his postseason where he averaged 41 points on 51% shooting in the finals. It's no wonder why so many people think this guy is the GOAT. Now thank god, Michael Jordan is off playing baseball, so this video can get at least a little bit interesting again. In 1994, Hakeem Olajuwon won the MVP award, but he just barely keeps the award from other great bigs like David Robinson and Shaquille O'Neal. Hakeem filled up every spot on the stat sheet, averaging 27.3 points, 11.9 rebounds, 3.6 assists, 1.6 steals, and 3.7 blocks. Out of all the dominant centers, he was the one recognized as the best defender, making first team all defense. If you look at the numbers of Shaq and Robinson, they're actually very similar to Elijah ones, so you can make an argument for each big. But given the fact that Elijah Wan was the one who originally won the award, it would seem wrong to take the award away from him when we're just splitting hairs. In 1995, David Robinson won the MVP award, and he's keeping the award over Shaq and Akeem Elijah Wan. Now in hindsight, people remember 94 and 95 as the years Jordan was gone and Hakeem dominated the NBA. But at the end of the 1995 regular season, it didn't necessarily seem that way, as Robinson was clearly the correct choice for the MVP award based on the regular season. It appeared it was potentially their year to win the championship as he led San Antonio to a league best 62 wins. He was first team all defense, he easily had the best player efficiency rating in the league, he had the best true shooting percentage out of the top 7 MVP contenders, and he had his usual monstrous numbers. The Rockets were actually underdogs in the playoffs and Hakeem went on to prove himself as the greater playoff performer, but Robinson comfortably keeps the title of best player that regular season. MJ is back, and in 1996, he won the league MVP thanks to the Bulls' 72-10 record, and on this list, he keeps the award. Statistically, he wasn't as dominant as his years before his first retirement, but if he lost a step, it was a small one, as he averaged a league-leading 30.4 points, 6.6 .6 rebounds, 4.3 assists, and 2.2 steals on 49.5% shooting. He was still the league's best defending shooting guard, making first team all defense, and he also shot a remarkable 42.7% from three point range. Now take this three point percentage with a major grain of salt, because the three point line was temporarily shortened by a couple feet for the 96 and 97 seasons, meaning a lot of players three point percentages went up, not just MJ's. With all that being said, he was still the league's best player, followed by Hakeem Olajuwon. In 1997, Carl Malone won the MVP award and Michael Jordan took it personally. But what might surprise many of you is that Carl Malone actually keeps this award slightly over MJ. In the official MVP voting, Jordan came in as the runner-up in a very close race, which is honestly surprising considering Jordan's Bulls won 69 games compared to the Jazz who won 62. But when you simply look at the regular season from an individual standpoint, Malone was simply the more productive player. Both legends made first team all defense, and when you look at their numbers side to side, you can see why Malone keeps his edge. He had a significantly higher field goal percentage and true shooting percentage, his player efficiency rating was higher than MJ's, and it was also the league's best. Plus Malone did all of his damage in less minutes per game. Playoffs are another discussion, but as far as who is the best player in this regular season, Malone legitimately earned it. In 1998, Michael Jordan won his fifth and final MVP award. But under this new format, he actually loses the award to Carl Malone. From a story and impact narrative, Jordan certainly deserves the MVP. Scottie Pippen missed basically the first half of the season, and MJ offensively carried the team, leading them to a 62-20 record as a 34-35 year old player. And that's probably why he won the MVP in the traditional format. But from a pure production standpoint, it's certainly difficult to argue that Malone wasn't the better player that regular season. If you saw these two stat lines next to each other, with no names beside them, the decision would probably be easy on who had the better season. But the names cloud the production because one is obviously Michael Jordan. Both players were once again first team all defense, but Malone was also significantly more efficient and had a much better player efficiency rating. Some of you guys might look at this season and think that Shaq was actually the best player from a production standpoint, and there's certainly an argument to be made, but he dealt with some injuries and only played 60 games that season compared to Jordan's 82 and Malone's 81, 
so it's difficult for me to justify giving any award to a player who misses more than 25% of the season. In 1999, Carl Malone won the league MVP and he was the oldest player to ever win the award, but now he loses the award to Shaquille O'Neal. In a lockout shortened season of only 50 games, Malone was rewarded for leading his team to the best record in the league, but Shaq was clearly the more dominant individual player as he scored more, rebounded more, and was more efficient than Carl Malone, and the rest of the league for that matter. Shaq was just starting to reach his prime and easily had the best PER that season. What makes his numbers even more impressive was the fact that 1999 was the lowest scoring season since the 1950s as teams only averaged 91.6 points per game. So the fact that Shaq put up 26.3 points and 10.7 rebounds with such limited opportunities is pretty remarkable. In the year 2000, Shaquille O'Neal won the MVP award by a wide margin, and if it was given to the best player that season, Shaq would still keep the award. This was the greatest version of Shaq we ever saw, as he averaged 29.7 points, 13.6 rebounds, 3.8 assists, and 3 blocks, on 57.4% shooting. It was his personal career high in points, rebounds, assists, and blocks. There wasn't a player in the league who was as coveted as Shaq was at that time. His dominance controlled the game like no other player could and it was on both sides of the court. He should have been the first ever unanimous MVP winner, but one delusional voter out of a total of 121 voters thought Allen Iverson should win the award instead. Speaking of Iverson, in the year 2001, Allen Iverson won the MVP award, but if it was actually given to the best player that season, Iverson would lose the award, and it would have gone to Shaq instead. This isn't intending to take anything away from Iverson's greatness, as I recognize that he had an amazing season carrying the 76ers offensively. He averaged 31.1 points, 4.6 assists, and 2.5 steals on 42% shooting. His 76ers won the most games in a weaker Eastern Conference that year, and that was part of the reason he beat out Shaq in the race. But if we're being honest, Shaq impacted the game in more ways than Allen Iverson did, as O'Neal dominated on both the offensive and defensive side of the court, unlike Iverson. O'Neal's production was just slightly below his near-unanimous MVP season, but it really wasn't that far off, as he averaged 28.7 points, 12.7 rebounds, 3.7 assists, and 2.8 blocks on 57% shooting. Shaq also had a player efficiency rating of 30.2, which is ridiculously high. It was actually the highest that season by far, beating out Allen Iverson by more than six points, which again, just emphasizes how he impacted the game in more ways. In 2002, Tim Duncan won the league MVP award, and on this new list, he keeps the award, but barely. Duncan put up averages of 25.5 points, 12.7 rebounds, 3.7 assists, and 2.5 blocks on 50.8% shooting in what was arguably the best regular season of his career. Shaq's production had again dipped from the previous year, but this time he didn't even make an all-defense team appearance, while Duncan was the best at his position in that area, making first team all-defense. Kobe also began to break out this season, but in terms of efficiency, statistically, and overall impact on both ends, Duncan maintains his edge. In 2003, Duncan was once again the league MVP winner, but now he barely loses the award to Kobe Bryant. If the playoffs and the NBA Finals were part of the award-winning equation, then Duncan certainly wouldn't be giving this award up, because his postseason was dominant on a historical level. His regular season averages were 23.3 points, 12.9 rebounds, and 2.9 blocks on 51% shooting. Kobe, on the other hand, averaged 30 points, 7 rebounds, 6 assists, and 2 steals on 45% shooting and 38% from 3-point range. Although Duncan has the edge in field goal percentage, Kobe and Duncan had an almost identical true shooting percentage. It's probably the most underrated season of Kobe's career, as he was finally beginning to establish himself as the Lakers' best player. Within this season, Kobe had a night where he set an NBA record with 12 three-pointers made in a game, and he also had a historic streak of 9 straight 40-point games, which excluding Wilt Chamberlain, is tied for the most consecutive games ever with Michael Jordan. He averaged 40.6 points in the entire month of February and shot 47% from the field and a remarkable 43% from three-point range, and the Lakers won 11-3 in that stretch. He did all of this while locking up guys on the other end of the court. There's certainly an argument to be made for Duncan to keep it, but for me, Kobe was the best player this season. In 2004, Kevin Garnett was the MVP winner, 
and he's going to keep the award because he was easily the league's best player that season. Shaq's game had continued to drop off as he famously began that season significantly overweight and only averaged slightly over 20 points per game that year, which is disappointing by his standards. Kobe was dealing with a multitude of injuries and was also caught in the middle of the Colorado Trials. So although he had an impressive season when all things are considered, he was still producing well below his usual standards. Tim Duncan had a good year, but Kevin Garnett had the best season of his life as he averaged 24.2 points, 13.9 rebounds, 5 assists, 1.5 steals, and 2.2 blocks on 50% shooting. He led his team in 4 out of the 5 major statistical categories, nearly leading his team in every major category for the second straight season. Essentially, Garnett made this year one of the easiest decisions I had to make for this list. In 2005, Steve Nash won the MVP award, and this time he loses the award to Kevin Garnett. This was a tough season to choose as no one clearly stood out among the crowd, and I could see a solid argument being made for up to 8 different players. Nash was the engine that drove the Suns incredible offense, but very few people would go as far as saying that he was the league's best player, even if he won the MVP. His player efficiency rating is far lower than just about every other MVP candidate, and Nash was never known to be a good defensive player, which is literally half the game. Shaq had a good bounce back season with Miami, but clearly wasn't the force he once was defensively. Kobe had arguably his worst season of the 2000s, as he was well below his efficiency standards and the Lakers were losing a ton and he did not make an all defense team appearance that season, which is a rare miss for him. In the actual MVP voting, Garnett finished barely outside of the top 10, but that was in large part because of the team's overall lack of success winning just 43 games. That wasn't his fault though, as he was once again a statistical monster on both ends, averaging 22.2 points, 13.5 rebounds, 5.7 assists, 1.5 steals, and 1.4 blocks on 50% shooting. In 2006, Nash won his second straight MVP award, but he's losing this one as well, this time to Kobe Bryant. It's not that Nash didn't have a good season, because he did, putting up 18.8 .8 points and 10.5 assists on a 50-40-90 season. It's just that Kobe had individually the best season of his career, as he put up 35.4 points, 5.3 rebounds, 4.5 assists, and 1.8 steals on 45% shooting. In this season, he also made first team all defense, making this year the highest scoring season by a player to ever officially make first team all defense. He also had his iconic performances of 62 and 3 quarters and 81 points against the Raptors just a month later. The Suns finishing as the number 2 seed and the Lakers finishing as the number 7 seed was the major difference in the actual MVP voting, but at the time, Kobe was clearly the better overall player. In 2007, Dirk Nowitzki won the MVP award, but he loses this one to a prime Kobe Bryant. Dirk had a fantastic season with averages of 24.6 points and 9 rebounds on 50-40-90 percentages, and his Mavericks won 67 games, which often means the best player on that team wins the MVP award. I'm starting to sound a bit repetitive at this point, but it's something I can't ignore, and that's the defensive end. I simply think it's almost impossible to be considered the best player in the league if you're not also elite on the defensive end. Dirk was certainly a capable defender, but never at any point of his career was he considered elite. Kobe on the other hand was once again first team all defense to go along with his averages of 31.6 points, 5.7 rebounds, 5.4 assists, and 1.4 steals on 46% shooting. In 2008, Kobe won his first actual MVP award, but on this new list, he actually loses the award to Chris Paul. Now hear me out. This was a very heated MVP race, and once again, if the postseason was included, we would have a different story and Kobe would keep his award. But since it's just the regular season, I'm completely confident in saying that Chris Paul was the best player this season. CP3 has been in the league for so long now that a lot of people don't know how good he was in his prime. And Chris was one of those rare cases where the prime of his career was actually in his early 20s. New Orleans CP3 was just on a separate level from his Clippers and Rockets days. Sure, Kobe had averages of 28, 6, and 5 on 46% shooting while being elite defensively, but Paul also made first team all defense that season, putting up averages of 21.1 points, 11.6 assists, 4 rebounds, and 2.7 steals on 49% shooting. 
The 22-year-old led the league in assists and steals and was the best defender at his position. He simply dominated in more ways than Kobe did, which is reflected in his significantly higher player efficiency rating that season. In 2009, LeBron James won his first MVP award, and in this new format, he keeps the award, but barely. LeBron led his Cavs to 66 wins, but even outside of the team accomplishments, he just had a fantastic year on an individual level, averaging 28.4 points, 7.6 rebounds, 7.2 assists, 1.2 steals, and 1.1 blocks on 49% shooting. This was also his first season making the NBA's all-defense team. Kobe had a great season as well and went on to win the NBA championship. But statistically, LeBron clearly had the superior regular season. Dwayne Wade, on the other hand, had very similar numbers to LeBron. But his Heat only won 43 games, so he was hardly considered for the actual MVP. LeBron keeps this award over Wade, though, mostly due to his first-team all-defense appearance and his higher PER than Wade's that season. In 2010, LeBron James was the league MVP, and on this new list, he keeps the award. The actual MVP voting wasn't even close this season, as LeBron led a Cavs team that was devoid of superstar support to a league-best 61 wins. But even if we disregard team success and evaluate LeBron's season on an individual level, he still runs away with the award, as he averaged 29.7 points, 8.6 assists, 7.3 rebounds, and 1.6 steals on 50.3% shooting. On top of all of these nice offensive numbers, James also established himself as one of the NBA's best defensive players, as he made first team all defense for the second straight season. Kobe obviously had a really nice season as well as he went on to win his second straight title, but his regular season numbers were actually pretty tame compared to LeBron's, and if the Mamba was the MVP of anything that year, it was definitely the playoffs. A 21-year-old Kevin Durant also had a monstrous season offensively, but the skinny star hadn't quite made a name for himself yet on the defensive end, so in that case, LeBron maintains his firm grasp on the award. In 2011, Derrick Rose was the MVP, becoming the youngest player in NBA history to ever win the award. As awesome as that year was, on this list, he loses the MVP to LeBron James. The 2011 MVP race is one of the most interesting debates of basketball history. Derrick Rose indeed had a spectacular season, with averages of 25 points, 7.7 .7 assists, and 4.1 rebounds on 44.5% shooting as he led the Bulls to the best record in the league. But LeBron had even greater numbers, with arguably his best season on the defensive end, once again making first team all defense. It was a weird season for the King, as it was his first season in Miami, alongside of two other legitimate superstars, which may have affected how the voters placed their votes. But if we're looking at it objectively, LeBron was clearly the more productive player, in terms of efficiency, defensively, and in advanced analytics. Obviously, this season for LeBron is remembered most famously for his disappointing performance in the NBA Finals, but only the regular season is being factored in here, so his award is safe. Honorable mention goes to Dwight Howard, who won his third straight Defensive Player of the Year. But even Dwight at his best isn't quite on the same level as LeBron in any of his years with the Heat. In 2012, LeBron James won the MVP in a lockout shortened season, and he's keeping the award once again. This one will be quick, because James was easily the most dominant player this season as he averaged 27.1 points, 7.9 rebounds, 6.2 assists, and 1.9 steals on 53.1% shooting. Kevin Durant had a good season as well, putting up 28, 8, and 3 on just under 50% shooting. But despite those nice numbers, it really wasn't even close, because unlike Durant, LeBron was first team all defense once again. He easily had the highest player efficiency rating that season, he led the league in win shares, and he also had the league's best plus minus. We're not even factoring in how he dominated the playoffs, won the championship, and the finals MVP. No matter what formula you use to decide the MVP winner, LeBron comes out on top in 2012. In 2013, LeBron James won the MVP award yet again, and he's keeping the award because this is arguably the best season of his career and one of the greatest seasons in NBA history. Kevin Durant had a monstrous season, averaging 28, 8, and 5 on 51% shooting and 41% from three-point range. Kobe also had an epic year and what was his last MVP caliber season of his career, which ended in the famous Achilles tear. Despite those valiant efforts, there was absolutely nothing LeBron didn't do this year, as he led the Heat to 66 wins and their legendary 27-game winning streak. By nature of this new MVP formula, I'm not allowed to count LeBron's team success to his best player case, but he doesn't need it. 
He averaged 26.8 points, 8 rebounds, 7.3 assists, and 1.7 steals on an absurd 56.5% shooting and 40.6% from three-point range. He was an absolute force on the defensive end, swatting shots, locking down the opposing star, and not only did he make first team all defense, but he actually finished as a close second in the Defensive Player of the Year voting. He easily led the league in PER, win shares, and plus minus, and had an unbelievable 64% true shooting percentage. From top to bottom, all around, on every spot of the court, from beginning of the season to its very end, LeBron had a year for the record books. In 2014, Kevin Durant won the MVP award, and he's actually keeping the award just slightly ahead of LeBron. It's possible that Oklahoma City's 59 wins compared to Miami's 54 wins was the swaying factor in the actual MVP voting. Maybe even voter fatigue played a factor against LeBron. But even outside of that, I still give the edge to Durant in what was basically just a heated two-man race. LeBron put up 27.1 points, 6.9 rebounds, 6.3 assists, and 1.6 steals on a tremendous 56.7% shooting. It was going to take something pretty incredible to stop this streak that LeBron had going, and that's just what KD did, as he put up 32 points, 7.4 rebounds, 5.5 assists, and 1.3 steals on 50.3% shooting. He was lethal from everywhere on the floor, as he not only comfortably led the league in scoring this year, but he nearly had a 50-40-90 season while doing it. If he had pulled off the 50-40-90 feat, it would have been the highest scoring 50-40-90 season in all of NBA history. The major advanced stats are almost entirely in his favor as well, as he led the league in player efficiency rating, win shares, and plus minus. If there was ever a time where KD was the best player in the league, in my humble opinion, this was it. In 2015, Steph Curry won his first MVP award, and now he loses the award to Anthony Davis. You must be asking, Anthony Davis? Yep. But let me start by explaining that this is easily the weakest group of MVP candidates in this decade. Steph won the award in large part due to his Warriors having a league-best 67 wins, and his three-point shooting was pioneering its way to the next era of basketball. But he certainly wasn't an elite defensive player, and when you take a look at the numbers, they're kind of tame compared to the usual MVP standards. LeBron James had a solid regular season, but it was also a significant drop-off from his Miami production, as he was now shooting below 50% from the field, and this was the first year where we could visibly notice that LeBron's on-ball defense had substantially gotten worse. James Harden and Russell Westbrook had solid seasons too, but the edge remains with a 21-year-old Anthony Davis. He didn't place higher in the actual MVP voting because his Pelicans only won 45 games. But that wasn't his fault, as he had the least star power supporting him out of all the other serious MVP candidates. Davis put up averages of 24.4 points, 10.2 rebounds, 1.5 steals, and 2.9 blocks on 53.5% shooting. AD was also an elite rim protector as he comfortably led the league in blocks this season. Out of the top 5 MVP finalists, he was the only one to make an all-defense team appearance as he finished 4th overall in the Defensive Player of the Year voting. Throw in the fact that he was lethal from the free throw line as a big man, and he also had the league's best player efficiency rating, and that's enough to get my vote this season. In 2016, Steph Curry became the first ever unanimous MVP winner, and on this new list, he keeps the award. I believe this is the first winner I've picked in the series where I'm able to overlook the fact that he's not elite defensively. Other players had pretty good 2016 campaigns, but it's basically pointless to talk about anyone other than Curry because of how far and wide he separated himself from the rest of the competition. Everyone remembers the Warriors went 73-9 to break the Bulls' all-time record, but he doesn't even need that working in his favor to stand out. He absolutely shattered the NBA record for three-pointers made in a season with 402. At the time, no one else had even made over 300 in a season. On top of that, he shot 45.4% from three-point range. To make that many three-pointers on that percentage over the course of a season is something that seemed basically unhuman up to that point. He led the league in scoring and steals as he averaged 30.1 points, 6.7 assists, 5.4 rebounds, and 2.1 steals on 50.4% shooting. It was his first 50-40-90 season and is still the highest scoring 50-40-90 season of all time. Furthermore, he led the league in free throw percentage, true shooting percentage, player efficiency rating, win shares, and plus minus. 
Dare I say, I think we as a basketball community have already started to lose track of how incredible Steph Curry was during the 2016 regular season. In 2017, Russell Westbrook won the MVP in a season where he averaged a triple-double, and on this new list, he's keeping the award, slightly ahead of James Harden and LeBron James. Westbrook dominated offensively for the Thunder and carried the team to the playoffs in their first season without Kevin Durant. Westbrook's 2017 campaign still has the highest usage rate of any season in NBA history. He led the league in scoring with averages of 31.6 points, 10.7 rebounds, 10.4 assists, and 1.6 steals on 42.5% shooting. Some people won't like this choice since many people have criticized Westbrook for being a stat patter. And sure, maybe Steven Adams let Westbrook have a couple rebounds here and there, but even if we knock off a couple of his rebounds per game, you still can't help but be incredibly impressed by his production this season. Something I rarely see people mention is how Westbrook put up monstrous video game numbers in such little time. He averaged 34.6 minutes per game, and that put him in only 20th place, well behind most elite superstars. James Harden had fantastic numbers as well while playing a couple more minutes per game. Both stars had very comparable shooting statistics, but Harden actually set the record for the highest turnover per game average in NBA history at 5.7, which doesn't really help his case. LeBron's level of production is a little too far behind in order to strongly consider him for the award this season, and he doesn't have elite defense working in his favor anymore either. None of these candidates do for that matter. With all this being said, Westbrook was simply on another level this year, even if you take away a rebound or two and the triple-double achievement. In 2018, James Harden won his first MVP award, and now he loses the award to LeBron James. In the actual MVP voting, this was a tough two-man race between Harden and LeBron. Harden led the league in scoring behind strong averages of about 30 points, 5 rebounds, 9 assists, and 2 steals on 45% shooting. His Rockets won a league-best 65 games that season, so I definitely think the best player on the best team logic had a strong influence in the voting. LeBron, on the other hand, put up 27.5 points, 8.6 rebounds, 9.1 assists, and 1.4 steals on a significantly more efficient 54.2% shooting. Not only do LeBron's numbers appear to be slightly better, but LeBron also played in all 82 games that regular season, a feat that none of the other MVP candidates were able to achieve that year, and Harden played a total of 10 less games. Not only do people regularly recognize LeBron as the better player, but this season, he had the production and consistency to back it up, without the playoffs even being factored in, in which case, it would have not been close. In 2019, Giannis won the MVP, and he's keeping the award just slightly ahead of James Harden. It's gonna go down as one of the more controversial and hotly debated MVPs of league history, and I expect this comment section to be more of the same. I wrestled with this one for a while, but ultimately, I believe Giannis was the more complete player. He averaged 27.7 points, 12.5 rebounds, 5.9 assists, 1.3 steals, and 1.5 blocks on 58% shooting. Compare that to Harden, who dropped 36.1 points, 6.6 .6 rebounds, 7.5 assists, and 2 steals on 44% shooting. I gotta admit, I feel a little crazy for not giving the best player award to a man who averaged a well-rounded 36 points per game, but here's my major reasons why. For one, Giannis was clearly the better defensive player. Now that's not to hate on Harden, whose on-ball defense has improved tremendously in recent years, and more specifically, his defense in the post. But even with that being said, he's not Giannis, who was the main reason why the Bucks had the league's number one ranked defense that season, and Giannis finished second overall in the Defensive Player of the Year voting. Another aspect is how Giannis played only 32.8 minutes per game, which is insane, and was ranked 37th in the league compared to Harden, who was third overall in minutes per game. Not enough is said about how crazy it is that Giannis consistently puts up MVP numbers on a role player's amount of minutes. Overall, I'm not a big fan of the per 36 minutes stat, because it's not fair to simply prorate a guy's numbers and pretend that it's actual production. But with that being said, Giannis does so much with so little that I can only imagine if he had a league leader's amount of minutes. In 2020, Giannis was selected as the league's MVP, and he's keeping the award slightly ahead of James Harden. Both players were incredibly impactful for their squads, but unlike Harden, Giannis was first team all defense. Even greater than that is the fact that he was that season's defensive player of the year. 
Maybe the most impressive thing about the Greek Freak this season is the fact that his ridiculous stat line came in only 30.4 minutes of action per game. If he had played league leading minutes, his stat line would have looked similar to a prime Wilt Chamberlain, which is certainly enough to win the award, especially when your team ends up with the best record in the NBA. In 2021, Nikola Jokic won his first MVP award, and he's keeping that award ahead of Embiid, Steph, and Giannis. The Joker had a season for the ages, as he completely dominated the advanced analytics. Not only did he have a near triple-double average, but he also shot a stellar true shooting percentage of 64.7%. Unlike every other MVP candidate that season, Jokic played all 72 games that year, which is basically unheard of by modern day standards. There is the complaint that his defense isn't up to the level of some of the other candidates, and although I agree with that, the gap isn't enough to overlook the way he stood out all year offensively. In 2022, Nikola Jokic won his second straight MVP, and he's keeping the award despite great campaigns from Joel Embiid and Giannis. Somehow, Jokic took what he accomplished the previous season and improved upon it, as his scoring, rebounding, player efficiency rating, and true shooting percentage all shot up tremendously. His Nuggets weren't even a top-seeded team, but the voters were willing to look past that for just how statistically historic this season was. Once again, out of the top five finishers in the MVP race, Jokic played the most games, and by no small margin either. So here's a recap of all the changes and winners of the award. Just exactly how stupid do you think I am for my selections? Feel free to set me straight in the comment section below. Thanks for watching as always, make sure to like and subscribe for more basketball content, and I'll see you guys in the next video.